So, good morning. Um, yeah, we are talking in a moment about von Neumann algebras, and we want to see how free probability theory uh, allows us to get some information about the structure of von Neumann algebras. So, last time I recalled some basic uh, definitions and properties of von Neumann algebras. Uh, so, the main point is, I mean, von Neumann algebras are Subalgebras of bounded operators of the Hilbert space, which are closed in some topology, and this is a quite weak topology. So this means, I mean, for normal algebras are usually very big things. Uh, they contain a lot of operators, and we have a lot of possibilities for doing operations uh, which stay within the for normal algebra. So this means it's, it's hard to, uh, yeah, to classify for normal algebras because of, they are so big things that we can deform them, and we might still have the same object. Uh, isomorphic for Neumann algebra, and so we want to uh, yeah, control this somehow. And one of the main uh, constructions for von Neumann algebras is a group for Neumann algebra. So we are starting from a group, then we are representing this group uh, by left multiplication on itself, and so we get, so, so we take the Hilbert space given by the group, and then uh, the uh, represent the group by multiplication of itself by bound operators, and then you take the closure in the corresponding topology, and then you get a von Neumann algebra. But the question is, what is this von Neumann algebra? Huh? A priori, it might be B of H, but it turned out, and it's not everything, usually we get interesting von Neumann algebras, and in particular, uh, if our group has this uh, ICC property, uh, then uh, we get factors. A factor is a uh, for Neumann algebra is a trivial center, so those are the building blocks of general for Neumann algebra. And if we take as a group as infinity, then we get the famous hyperfinite factor, which is quite well understood. Uh, but then we go somehow to another extreme, a very non commutative group, maybe the most non commutative group, not namely the, the free group. And again, we get a factor, they are called free group factors, uh, but we don't know really much about at least up to the point when Moekulescu uh, started free probability to uh, understand the structure of those, not much was known. Huh? And the main thing was that they are not isomorphic to the hyperfinite factor. They are really different uh, from Neumann algebras. But even uh, whether there is only one or more uh, free group factors is not clear huh? because we have n of fn for each n huh? and they might be the same or they might not be the same. And that's one of the big questions. Uh, the free group, that is the free group factor isomorphism problem, which is still uh, okay. But we know we know more, we know more about the free group factors, and I want to give you some idea how free probability uh, can help with this. Um, okay, so when we looked, so so the, the free group factors uh, are generated by the group elements, which are unitary operators in this representation, uh, and in this representation, they are high unitaries with respect to the canonical underlying state, and they are also free. That's not very surprising because the definition of freeness was made according to this. Oh, good. Okay, so what we have is that the free group factors are generated, so let's say n of fn. That's the conclusion from last time, that's where we stopped. So, n of fn, that's the free group factor, which is generated, so fn is the, is the, is the free group of n generators, so this guy is as a Neumann algebra, generated, of course, by the generators of the group in this representation, and those guys are n uh, high unitaries, which are also free with respect to the canonical state, huh, which is the one which we always consider in the algebra. So my n3 high unitaries. Well, that this is a high unitary just means that if I take powers of my group elements, they are never the uh, neutral element, huh, which is of course clear because it is uh, <coughs> a feature. Good. Okay, so this sounds good. But of course, we, sh we should uh, realize for now the definition of freeness was telling us something about polynomials of our generators. Huh? So we have here the, 
the generators, which are free, and this means we know something about the algebras generated by those. No? So this means we know something about polynomials. But of course, n of fn is generated not by polynomials, generated by polynomials, but in the sense that they are only dense. No? So this means uh, we should also be able to go over to more general functions, no? in a sense, going over to measurable functions of our generators. No? Okay. This notion of freeness in this context is only relevant, important, if we can really transfer freeness from polynomials to measurable functions or to generate from other algebras. And that's really what is the case, so that's what we want to see. Normal is, is a name which has 
It's used too many names, so I mean, okay. uh, so this normal has nothing to do with, with the Gauss distribution, which is called the normal distribution. It has nothing to do with that the operator is normal, which means it commutes with a joint, but it's just another normal situation for, for states. Uh, okay, so in this context, what does normal mean here? There are various ways of saying this. Uh, I mean, of course, in principle, what, what should it be? It should be continuous with respect to the topology which we have here, uh, which we take for the closure. Okay, but uh, it's also another, there's also an abstract way of saying it, because I mean, if, if, if we use the topology here, then we rely on the fact how we have embedded, realized, represented M somewhere. Uh, but there's also a, an abstract notion which only looks internally on M, independent of how it is realized. And that's maybe the general definition. So how it's normal if if it is yeah, if it yeah, uh, commutes with some operations which I can do here, and this is taking the sub of uh, increasing nets of the joint operator. So let me say so tau of the sub of x lambda over lambda is the same as the sub over lambda. The x lambdas here are an increasing sequence uh, of several joint operators. So I mean, there's an order structure on C star of normal algebras, or operators, <coughs> and then I can talk about the soup. And so this is an operator in my normal algebra. Tau of this should be the same as taking the soup after applying tau. Uh, so this is a soup over real number. And in general, I mean, uh, one has to go over nets for this in such a setting mode. Just for sequences, but this is just a tentative. So, okay, so for any increasing net standard of several joint operators, and it's done lambda in there. Okay, this is an abstract definition, but of course, luckily enough, it's, it's equivalent. Uh, to what, what we would think it should be, namely if M is realized as a subset of on B of H, and on B of H we have this uh, weak operator topology, then it is continuous with respect to this, at least if we restrict it uh, from the subsets. And I mean, that, that's the crucial thing, which is important for us, uh, because we usually work that. Okay, so. Internal, which only uses the internal structure of the Norman algebra, uh, is equivalent in fact divided on B of H, then uh, tau restricted the unit ball. Restricted to any bounded uh, set, uh, there it is continuous uh, with respect to the operator topology, oh, which was a topology given by taking the inner products with all possible uh, vectors. Good. Okay, uh, so this just means I mean, you want tau, which has the right continuity property, and of course. House which we consider better should have this property. But that's usually the case because, in particular, uh, usually, typically, our states, our states for Roman algebra, are of the form that the power of x is given by applying x to a vector psi and taking the inner product as psi. Uh, for some unit vector major space. Uh, that's exactly, it's exactly how the tau was given in our case for the group algebra. Uh, because then the C was the, the, the neutral element of the group in the element space. Uh, so it works exactly this form. Uh, okay, so usually a state which we consider of this form for some 
community vector psi in the underlying river space if such guys are always small. Oh, because, I mean, because the topology makes inner borders continuous, and this is just inner border. And such vector states, states really are called vector states because they are given by some specific vector, uh, are always. Also, in particular, the state if you consider on the free group factor is a normal state. use all the properties of this context. Okay, and then maybe another thing which I also want to mention is that I have defined here for normal algebra by taking the closure in this weak operator topology, but in this context there are a couple of other topologies around which more or less are restricted at least to some subset all equivalent. And another prominent one is the strong operator topology. And for, for, for many arguments in this context, I mean, sometimes it's better to use that your algebra is close to weak operator topology. Sometimes it's, it's better to use that it is, it's in a strong one, and you're you're going from one to the other. Yeah? Because I mean, they have not all the same properties. Oh, okay. And so maybe I also just want to mention this. Uh, there is also a strong operator topology, which is which is also a topology given by semi norms. But instead of taking inner products, I take just the norm of vectors attached to the state. Also, strong operator topology. Uh, so this is the convex, that is locally convex topology. So this means it's generated by uh, semi norms. Uh, semi norms. But not the ones which we used for the, the weak operator topology, but now we take the semi norms which are indexed by a vector, and then we just take the norm of x applied to this vector. Uh, in weak operator topology, we took the inner product of x applied to a vector, uh, the inner product is another vector. Okay, and one point is I mean, if I restrict those topologies to some nice Subsets of P of H they are equivalent. Oh, they are not equivalent in all of P of H, but usually on most sets I'm interested in, they are equivalent. So in particular, if I have a unitary star sub algebra, uh, and then if I take the weak operator topology closure, I get a phenomenal algebra, but this is the same as taking the strong operator topology, which as we know is the same as taking the oh. uh, Star sub algebra um, A B of H, uh, which for example could be a, a star sub algebra generated by some generators. Uh, we take the phenomenon algebra generated by this, which by our original definition is that we take everything which, which you can approximate the weak operator topology by elements of A. But this is the same as taking the strong operator topology closure. And of course the bicompetent theorem tells us that this is the same as taking the bicompetent of all those elements. Okay, and in this context of normality, it's also <coughs> the case that, uh, that we also have the continuity of a normal state in this strong operator topology, restricted to bound sets. Good, okay. So this was just a preparation, but now let me give you the, the, the theorem, which tells us that freeness goes over from algebras to generate from normal algebras, which is of course the, the crucial thing in our context. Otherwise, free freeness would not be very important for normal algebra context. Okay, so here's the theorem. So consider from normal algebra. Algebra M equipped with a normal state. So tau, tau functional or linear functional from M to C. So it should be a normal state. So it should be 
positive, but it should be more and should be more no? in this sense. So it should have some stronger continuity. Okay, and now we want to see what happens with freeness in such a context. So freeness is something about uh, subalgebras. So assume we have subalgebras in M. This should be unit star subalgebra, uh, not necessarily for normal algebra, so just a unit star subalgebra, uh, which are free. Which are free with respect to our state half. Right? This means we know something about polynomials uh, of the we know something about uh, moments in this AI. Good. But now we are not interested in the subalgebra, but we want to go over to the von Neumann algebras. No? So we take for each of the AI, we take a von Neumann algebra closure. No? So we put MI, this is the von Neumann algebra, generally. No? Okay, no? So abstractly, this is the smallest von Neumann algebra which contains the MI, or we you know we can just take the, the strong or weak operator topology closure of this in B of H, or we can take the bicomitant. Good. Okay, and then if I claim is, then those MIs are also free. And see that we can uh, 
yeah, hopefully most information is free in the lab. Still, this doesn't tell me that this has to converge to this. 
but then I can control it. And of course, the A, J, lambda, which I have chosen here, they are, of course, in my algebra. Also, in the so, so, this value, A, J, lambda, are, of course, in the algebra from which the A, J is essentially, from which, yeah, from, yeah, from which is coming. So, the A, J is in the M, I, J. The M, I, J is the closure of the A, I, J. No? So, the J here should be from the algebra A and I G. So all of them are there. Uh, for um, good. So now we have, we are approximating the elements about which we want something to know about those approximating things. Oh, okay. And we want to know that the tau of the product of those guys is equal to zero. And we are approximating the product by the product of those guys. So it would be nice to see that the power of those guys are equal to zero. Which means, of course, we should use the finesse for them. So we should see, do we have the, uh, the assumptions which we need in the finesse? So, of course, those guys are coming from the right algebras, which have the right alternating condition. Uh, this is okay, but of course, this here is a priori not okay. Because if we approximate something where we know the limit we have tau is zero, this does not mean a priori that if we approximate it, tau of all approximating things is equal to zero. It just means that tau of the approximating things has to converge to zero. Okay, but we can repair this by just improving on our sequence here by just centering the guys. Because in the limit it doesn't make a difference. So by replacing. I mean, we still have that those guys <coughs> converge uh, to, uh, to the edge. Okay. And, uh, but now, of course, tau of this guy is equal to zero. So this still converges because tau, tau is normal, which means under this uh, convergence, uh, if, if the aj lambda converges to the aj, and the tau of aj lambda converges to the tau of aj, which is equal to zero. Okay. So maybe here in this norm inequality, uh, we are perturbing this a little bit, but of course it still means we can keep those under control. No? They stay bounded. <coughs> Independent of lambda. Because this, this here goes to zero. Good. Okay. So by replacing this, we can. Okay. Is equal to 
observed. And this is true for each lambda. And now we just go over to the limit and yeah, observing that we have enough continuity.
so this means essentially I mean L of Fn is generated by N star from the high unitaries, but at the moment we mean this, this, this very specific high unitaries. And now the point is that actually we can free us from this uh, concrete realization of the free high unitaries, and the point is that the only thing which is really important here is the star distribution of those guys. It's the point that we have N star free high unitaries, not how we have realized that. Uh, that's what we usually do in free probability theory. We don't care how our operators are concretely, concretely realized somewhere. We only care about uh, their star distribution. Okay. And we want to see that this is actually what is relevant in this context here. Uh, that we don't need this concrete uh, high unitaries, but N of Fn is generated by any N star. That's the next theorem, which tells us that actually to decide whether two von Riemann algebras are isomorphic, uh, it's enough to have generators which have the same star distribution. If we have faithful states. No? So, I mean, our tau's, usually they are faithful, and of course, faithful, faithfulness tells us uh, that we see enough the algebra structure under the state. Uh, faithfulness means that tau of a star a can only be zero if a is equal to zero. Uh, if tau of a star a is equal to zero, if a is not zero, then of course the state tau is not faithful, so it does not see everything which is going on in the formal algebra. Uh, so that's not a good state for us. So, and I mean, of course, all the states which we consider usually are faithful. Uh, so in particular, in this free group factor, uh, this, this tau is a faithful state. On the formal algebra, not on all of b of h, but only on the formal algebra. Good, so here's the theorem, which tells us this, which is not too hard theorem, but philosophically it's maybe the most important one if you want to apply freeness for our, our approach, our non commutative probability approach to phenomenal algebras. Uh, because it tells us it's really enough to know uh, the star distribution of general ones, if you want to understand from phenomenal algebra. Okay, so means let us assume we have two phenomena in the class and they are generated by some generators. So the first one is M, it's energy <coughs> generated by A1 up to A N. Uh, ok, 
Okay, and now we make the assumption that the star distribution of the A's is the same as the star distribution of the B's. Okay, so that's the information we usually have. So we know something about the A's and we know something about the B's. And if they are the same star distribution, then I'm claiming that two phenomena are the size of one. G 
GMS comes in part two. Then 
this is equal to zero. But now phi, such a polynomial, this is a star moment in the A's. No? I mean, if I multiply this out, this is the sum of uh, monomials in the A's. No? So this is the sum of, of star moments. And so this means if I'm now plugging in the BI's, it has the same value. No? Because I assume the star, the, the star distribution of the A's and the star distribution of the B's is the same. No? So this quantity here must be the same if I replace the A's uh, by the B's. No? So this means if I take the psi, the corresponding the moment, A, I take the B, the star, P of BI, this is also equal to zero. Good, but now I can apply the faithfulness of psi. You now you see, I need faithfulness because the moments have to tell me enough about algebraic properties. Also, if I apply psi to a positive element, this is a positive element, and this is equal to zero, then the element itself must be equal to zero. Okay. So this means, uh, yeah. This is equal to zero, which is the same as just saying this is equal to zero. Right, so you see, uh, if I'm assuming a polynomial in the A's is equal to zero, we get that the polynomial in the B's is also equal to zero. Right, so that, that's the, the main, yeah, main idea why the moments with respect to a faithful state contain enough information to deal with all algebraic uh, questions in the phenomenal algebra. And even questions which are in the in the phenomenal algebra closure, if we have normal normality. Of course, with GNS construction, we need normality so that such things also go over to the limit. Good, okay, so maybe let me make a few more remarks. I mean, this philosophy now allows us to, instead of saying N of Fn, is generated by those very concrete. Uh, u1 up to un, which are given by the left multiplication is the generators, by those very concrete n star free hybrid theories. And this tells us that whenever in any context we find uh, n, C, n free n star free hybrid theories, then they generate n of fn. Uh, so the phenomenon the which they generate is then isomorphic to n of fn. Uh, so we don't need this. Uh, the very concrete ones, which comes from the definition, uh, but we can go over to any any other context. Okay, of course, not so clear how helpful this is. Because I mean, of course, why GNS construction? Of course, all these contexts are isomorphic. So what maybe what is really the advantage of this freedom? Advantage is that we have even more freedom because uh, we can also start to deform distributions of our elements. Having n free high unitaries, uh, that we have high unitaries actually is not so important. The freeness, that's, that's the good thing. We can deform the high unitaries to something else. Particularly because uh, we have measurable functional tangles at our disposal. But we are not looking on those Raman algebras as 
given by operators acting on Hilbert space and Tommy act there. But we are shifting the perspective and we say, okay, all information is contained in the moments of those operators with respect to a faithful uh, state, and we should understand this time solution. Oh, okay. And looking on moments, that's really a kind of probabilistic perspective, because that's also what you do in classical mobility theory. You're talking about random variables. Those random variables are functions on underlying probability space equipped with some probability measure, but this underlying probability space is, is just a this is just a frame which usually is not really important. No? Okay, so you, you need it to, to get started somewhere. No? So, but, but you don't really use it very often. The only thing which you usually use in classical probability theory is the distribution of your random variables. No? And this also allows you to, to make changes of all of things. No? And this is a very similar thing here. Thing here no? So we are going away from maybe a more concrete uh, realization and really taking it serious that all information is contained in the moments. I mean, of course, this is a theorem which is not, not so deep. I mean, it's, it's contained in the basic theory of Raman algebras, but you have to take it serious. No? I mean, also, you have to take it serious that you are able to understand the moments of generators, no? because this is a huge collection of set. And if you have arbitrary operators, usually you cannot say much about it. But if you have freeness around, then you have an organizing principle for many of those moments. Okay. And so, at least in the context that freeness is there, like the free group factors, we have a chance of understanding the moments. And from this extract of the Well, okay, so this theorem, seven, means for change its perspective. Uh, 
random variables. Good, then maybe now back to our L of n. So we want to understand this. I mean, we have now shifted to perspective. We say you can understand L of fn if we understand its star distribution. Uh, but if this test is really yield some uh, interesting results, and we have to do something more. Right? So what this implies then, that the free group factor generated by and free star free high unitaries one up to n uh, where now we do not care anymore we just use how they completely look like well, they don't have to be coming from our left regular uh, representation of the group Uh, then we can 
backwards. And those functions of the generators generate the same Fermat algebra as the use. And f of u1 up to f of un generate the same Fermat algebra as u1 up to un. Um, okay. And you should know that, I mean, of course, that we are not losing the freeness between these stuff. <coughs> no, that was what we saw before. If the use are free, then measurable functions on them are also free. No? So this means we can replace uh, free high unitaries by free whatever we can get by changing the distribution of the use by this function. And we have quite a freedom of changing. No? Because uh, with measurable functional calculus, you can change any distribution which has no atoms, like the use, into any other distribution which has no atoms. Okay. So if, I mean, I can of course take here functions uh, which give me atoms. I mean, I could collapse. I mean, the use has the uniform distribution on the circle. No? The U is a unitary element, so it's spectrum with the circle, and having the hard distribution on the circle means I have a uniform distribution on the circle. No? So the kind of the background on the circle. No? Okay. Of course, I could take a function which collapses this, let's say, just to point zero and one. But then, of course, I cannot go backwards. Right? I mean, from atoms, I cannot go backwards. But, but I can change, in a measurable way, this uniform distribution to any other distribution which has no atoms. So this means we have here one degree of freedom of changing this to any distribution which we want, if it has no atoms. Um, Generated by n random variables, n, so I have 
operators in M, so assume that x1 to xn and m which generate m which generate m well, it's a programmer algebra so it's a programmer algebra generate by x1 to xn is equal to m also any element in m can be approximated in the big operator topology by polynomials in those guys or maybe in star polynomials I mean, star polynomials if I assume that the axes are self-adjoint and I have polynomials, uh, if, I have to, if they're not self-adjoint, then of course I mean I have to approximate by star polynomials. So things we are involved the x and the x stars. Um, good. Okay, and so I assume I have n generators, and those generators, I assume first of all that they are star free with respect to tau. So x1 to xn. Star free with respect to my state tau, and then furthermore, the distribution of each of them can be more or less as I like, but it should not have atoms. So, so each, <coughs> and of course, I mean, each of them should be normal. I mean, I'm, <coughs> I'm starting here with normal elements, the use are normal. If I apply functional calculus, I, I still have normal elements. So I cannot go away from normal elements. No? Okay. But actually, usually I will change them to self adjoint elements. No? The main normal elements which you consider are either self adjoint elements or unitary elements. Okay. And so, the x are normal. And then the distribution, which is a probability measure on the spectrum. Xi, the probability measure of complex, complex plane, so its distribution mean of Xi has no atoms. Okay, so if this is the case, then actually this von Neumann algebra M is isomorphic to the free proof vector. Well, okay, but now so this allows us to realize. N of Fn in quite different ways. Okay, we have here the freedom. Of course, I mean, we, we, should, we are not changing the freeness between our generators, huh? but, but the distribution of each gener generator we can change. Huh? But, but the freeness, we are changing the generators, the, the behavior between the generators is not changed. Freeness is, a, is an abstract concept which is uh, stable, robust against uh, changing, uh, taking functions of the generator. Uh, that, that's the, the main point of freedom. So that we have an abstract concept which tells us how is the relation between the generators even if I'm taking functions of my generators. The re relation between them is still the same. It's still, they are still free. Okay, so maybe one example, or maybe also one word to the maybe uh, the distribution. I think up to now we essentially talked about distributions as probability measures of operators for self-adjoint uh, uh, operators. But of course we also have this for normal operators. So maybe just to point this out. What this means. Just a few remarks. Okay, so just a remark on, on distribution.
joint, so which means in particular also that the for Neumann algebra generated just by this x is a commutative for Neumann algebra. Huh? And this means that we have the function of uh, yeah. uh, Okay, so if this is normal, then uh, x has a distribution. Uh, I mean, this distribution in general just means a collection of all star moments. But if it is normal, the star moments can be identified with a probability measure. And in this generality, it's a probability measure in a complex plane. Or more precisely on the spectrum uh, of x. So then we have x. This is the probability measure on the spectrum of x, which is uniquely determined by. I mean, uh, to now we consider this when we talk about the free convolution. The, we did this for several joint operators, which are of course normal, but I mean normal is a bigger class. Uh, so they are determined that by the fact, of course, that the, the moments, the star moments of X, I mean they are of this form. Right? In general, a star moment, of course, I multiply X and X stars, but if my operator is normal, I can compute X and X stars, so I can bring all X's at the beginning and then I have all the X stars. Right? So I mean, all the star moments of this form, and they are the same as the corresponding uh, moment of the measure in the complex plane. So we can set to the k, set bar to the L, uh, d mu x. So z is my integration variable, I'm integrating over the spectrum, which is a compact subset of the complex plane. Oh, and I mean, stone Weierstrass tells me that those guys are dense in the continuous functional plane, so this means this, the knowledge of those guys will be determined this as a probability measure. Okay, and that's what we used essentially for, uh, for self uh operators, but of course this is also true for normal and so on. So what's the measurable functional calculus for bound operators in the Hilbert space extends to the normal case. Um, good. And of course, a high unitary just what I said before, has a very nice uh, distribution. So for uh, high unitary U, one has because the spectrum of U is the unit, unit circle of complex numbers, actually one, uh, and the measure is just a uniform distribution on this. Because I mean, you can check if you, if you integrate, if you have a unitary here, I mean, then of course those guys you just have to integrate u to, u to the k and u to the minus k. And if you integrate this with respect to the uniform measure on the circle, you get always so, unless the power is so, which is exactly what the moments of the high unitary are. So this means for high unitary, this is new u. Uniform distribution, distribution. Okay, now we can change this, this distribution essentially. What we are saying here, we can change this to any distribution we like. Uh, and uh, so, in particular, for one is this. And so, we can map, for example, we can map. The circle to the real line. No? I mean, you can identify the circle is the interval from 0 to 2 pi by just going over to the polar coordinates. No? So you can go from S1 by mapping G to the 0 to 2 pi. Now, essentially, in this direction, we map T to the real line. IT. Okay, and of course, this transforms the uniform distribution on the circle to the uniform distribution of the signal. So it's mapping uh, for high unitary, like this. Distribution on the interval 
0 to 2 pi. Okay, so here I mean we have the distribution from the unit circle. Well, we have the uniform distribution here. Right, and this goes under this mapping over to a probability distribution, uh, which has constant density 1 on this interval and 0 outside. Right? Okay, but then we can transform this further. I mean, this is now a distribution of a, of a real random variable, of a server joint operator, but we can now apply other functions and we can transform this further. And maybe a nice thing, I mean, our most beloved distribution of three probabilities is a semicircle, so of course we can also transform this to a semicircle. Huh? We can take another function of this, which transforms the distribution into, into a semicircle. I mean, we can transform it to any. Thing which has no atoms, but of course we, we want nice things and nice things in the circle. So we can take another function which can then be transformed by a, let's say, another function on the interval 0 to pi. H to the interval from minus 2 to 2, uh, which transforms this distribution into the same circle from minus 2 to plus 2. Maybe give us more ideas uh, what we really can do with this LFA. 
Gut.